Everybody can hear me? Fantastic. So, so this is the title of my talk, uh, Demystif Demystifying the Definitions of the Surface, Deep and Dark Web. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people may have heard of the terms. Uh, some of you may have visited them, uh, and some of you may have not realized that you actually visited them before. So before I continue, let me give a brief introduction about myself. My name is Fadli, and uh, I'm a huge passionate individual uh, when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, and I, did a, I do a lot of research during the weekends. Uh, and I have a huge interest in quite a number of uh, topics in the cyber domain, especially cyber conflicts, cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, uh, and mainly uh, discussing more on the definitions of these terms. Uh, not an expertise in anything, I just have a huge interest in most of the things. Uh, and I've spoken to quite a number of conferences as well, and this is the second time I spoke, I'm speaking at uh, HITB uh, ComSec, so thank you, you, thank you guys for having me here. So, as a formality, I just want to say that uh, all views expressed in this presentation are my own, and do not represent the opinions of any entity with which I have been, am now, or will be affiliated. So, the agenda for today is basically what my aim here is to illustrate the definitions uh, of the three layers of the web, the surface, deep and dark web, and to provide practical examples so people understand uh, how do you apply these definitions in the real world. Uh, and hopefully by the end of these 30 minutes, uh, the audience over here as well as the viewers who will be watching this on YouTube will understand the key difference uh, between the three layers uh, and you will hopefully uh, possess the knowledge to question the use of these terms in current and future publications in the media. And at the same time, uh, we, I will be discussing quite a number of uh, stuff that hopefully you have the courage to download and explore for yourself. So, what is the deep web? And you know, a lot of people who have yet to come across to this term has a lot of questions. And in fact, these terms has been used, uh, has been abused actually, uh, and people equate the deep web to the dark web. And if you're looking for uh, a, a meaning to the deep web or try to explore, you will face quite a number of questions such as this. Uh, is the deep web illegal? Is it illegal in Singapore? Is it dangerous? Is it safe? Is it scary? So towards the presentation, we will tend to discuss this and hopefully we will get to answer this question as well. So while you try to search for these terms, it really doesn't help when you actually go to YouTube and type in dark web and you will see quite a number of results making you scared of trying to access the dark web. Uh, you will see things like cocaine, uh, you will see things like uh, weapons for sale, hitmen for hire, illegal pornography. And it's not just that, right? Uh, it's just another thing. You can actually find this in the deep web as well. Um, and when you have this kind of misinformation, or negative impression, you tend to blog about it, and people share their negative experiences uh, in their blogs. So things like, please stay away from the dark web, or sorry, please stay away from the deep web, uh, why you should avoid the deep web, without understanding what actually is the deep web. Right? So at the end of the day, hopefully you guys will understand what the deep web actually is, and how it differs from the dark web. So. So when you have all these things coming to, uh, that you read, that you came across, the blogs, the new videos, and, and, and all this misinformation, you tend to have fear. Fear to discover, fear to explore the dark web, right? This is one of my favorite bands, Iron Maiden. Uh, love the song. <laughs> and when you go to the news, uh, people focusing on, on you know, the criminal activities associated to the deep and dark web, you will come across these three terms, the dark web, the deep web, and the dark net. And whether you realize it or not, these terms are interchangeably used. And that's the reason why I think the terms are actually being abused because they don't really understand the difference between these three terms. Uh, and apparently most of these, they are actually trying to uh, define the same thing, relate to the same thing. So if you also try to explore or try to have some visualization of the deep web, or the dark web, when you go to Google image and try to find out more, you will tend to get this as a result, the famous iceberg. Uh, this iceberg basically is trying to share with you uh, or the definition, uh, how to apply those definitions, what examples of, of, of each of, their, of these three layers, 
And because of that, I think I'm going to use the same thing as well, so that it's easily represented uh, for everyone. So the definition for surface web is there, but the key word here is indexed content uh, by search engines. So anything that is indexed, anything that you can search from the Google search engine or any search engine, be it Bing, be it Yahoo, be it Yandex, um, anything that can be found from this search engine is considered the surface web. Anything, any index content, your website or, your, or whatever database, uh, a web application that, that can be indexed or already been indexed, that's actually the surface web. So, so to give a very easy example, when you try to go to your Gmail, instead of typing the whole URL, you go type in Gmail at the Google search and you find the first result. You right click, you open link a new tab, and you get a, a portal asking for your credentials. At this point of time, you are basically in the surface web portion. So when will you actually access the deep web? So by definition, it's there as well. Uh, to make it things simple, anything that is inaccessible by search engines, that's the deep web, right? And it's a very simple statement, which I think is very easily understood by everyone here. Anything that is not indexed, anything that you cannot find by your Google search or by any search engines, uh, that is constituted part of the deep web. So a very simple example here is when you go to, you know, type in Gmail, you open link new tab, you got, you got the portal asking for your credentials, that's the, that's, that's the surface web. The moment you log in using your credentials, Accessing your inbox, you are already part of the deep web because your inbox, your Gmail, your Yahoo Mail, Hotmail, or anything else, right? Those are the things that you cannot actually find or get from search engines or search results. So if you if you were to apply this concept to the iceberg, uh, it's very easy. The top part is a surface web, and the inbox where you can access is part of the deep web. So some of the examples here includes government citizen portal, you know, like your sync pass, uh, um, I'm trying to think at what else, uh, or your national library boards, actually, anything that requires you to log in, the content that you cannot access by a Google search, that's part of the deep web. Properly protected databases, and the reason why I mentioned properly protected databases is because some databases are misconfigured. And when, you, when, when it's being misconfigured, Using the proper Google search operators, they can actually find the content. Uh, cloud storages, for example, Dropbox. Everyone uses Dropbox here. Most, at least, um, those are part of the deep web as well because you can't easily get it from uh, the search engine. Uh, as I mentioned, password protected forums, banking accounts, and etc. Now, social media is also the same thing, uh, and it's always in between the surface layer and the deep web. The reason why is if you were to put, if you were to post your social media content in as a public post, right, where everyone can see, you can actually use Google or any search engine to find what you actually post, and actually you can actually find those via search uh, via the search engine. But if you were to put your content being between your friends or your close groups, these are the kind of uh, posts that you won't be able to see from the public. So. Social media is, is in between, halfway up surface web, and the other, most of it is on, in the deep web. So how big is the deep web? Uh, I came across quite a number of articles, and most of the time I've seen is either, most, some of them say it's 99%, some of them say it's 96%, and a handful of them describe it as 500 times bigger than a surface web. And the reason why it's big is very simple. Every one of us here has a certain kind of information located in the deep web. We use email, we use cloud storages, right? Realize it or not, most of our information, even though we are actually using the surface web for our, for our everyday things, look, finding information like going to news channel, uh, news media, uh, CNN, BBC.com, but most of our information you don't realize it that we're actually storing in the deep web. So if one individual has at least one terabyte of information that is stored somewhere out there, can you imagine one terabyte times how many billion people who is using the internet? 
And that's the reason why Deep Web is actually huge. So let's try to answer this question all together. All right? After sharing with you the definition, after sharing with you the application, um, and examples as well, let's try to answer this. Is the Deep Web illegal? Obviously not. Is it dangerous? Not at all. Is it illegal in Singapore? No. Is it safe? Absolutely. Is it scary? Now that's another thing altogether. All right, because the deep web can be scary by its own. Right? And I'm not even talking, I'm not even talking about the dark web. So let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, the dark web. So I like this definition because it mentioned very simple. The dark web is a subset of the deep web and you can actually assess it via a, uh, a, a particular browser called the top browser. All right? That's the dark web. So, when the OS of the Dwight Pirate Robbers, this is the OS that actually made the dark web famous. Uh, so, so this particular guy called this particular guy called Dwight Pirate Roberts, uh, who was the administrator slash operator for a known dark web marketplace called the Silk Road. Uh, he had his uh, site seized by the FBI, and eventually got arrested and sentenced to life in prison. And ever since this arrest, everyone is talking about the dark web. Uh, every now and then, even if, even now, people are actually still talking about the dark web. And even Singapore has its own case. In 2017, there was a Singaporean who actually got arrested for buying illegal uh, financial accounts uh, that he abused from the dark web. And because of, you know, media or journalists, researchers uh, are talking about this, uh, security researchers also wants to, you know, uh, take part in, in researching this. Uh, so what they found mostly is that the dark web, most of it considered to be of illegal stuff, despite um, having only 30,000 websites. And this was in 2016. In 2017, there was a, there was a, a, a case where a particular hacker brought down almost one-fifth of the dark web, um, and which is about 10,000. So, so 30,000 websites in the dark web in 2016, 50,000 in 2017. So probably in 2018, there could be about maybe 40,000, 60,000. Um, it's, it's small, right? Basically, the dark web is small. But one of the things in common for all this, the news that has been mentioning about the dark web, the research findings about how big, uh, how big or small the size is, they all have one thing in common is that is they are referring to this website that has a tall, uh, that is, that is, that has this dot onion top level domain. And the only way to access this is via Tor browser. So you download the Tor browser, you connect it, you go into the Tor network, and you input the top level domain, which is something dot onion, and you access it. So, my theory is why is it called the dark web is because of the mostly hidden criminal services uh, that you can access via the Tor browser. Uh, and the continuously publication of, of the dark web or dark illegal activities in the dark web uh, in the media, as well as the researchers' reports on mainly the illegal stuff as well. Hence, Tor is known as the dark side of the inter internet. Uh, and because of the mostly dark activities, hence the coining of the term the dark web. So this is my theory why it's called the dark web. So if you look at the news here, um, if we were to be specific based on a definition that I already shared, the, the definition of the deep web and the definition of dark web, and all these things, they are actually talking all about the dot onion uh, website in the dark web. So um, I believe that in this case, rather than using the term deep web in their newspaper articles, uh, they should actually use and be more specific uh, by using the term the dark web instead of the deep web because people can get confused. Uh, the deep web is actually big, but it's mostly nice things. It's, but the dark web is the one that they are actually referring to when, talk, when, when talking about illegal stuff. So in summary, uh, for the deep web versus the dark web, 
the dark web is small compared to the deep web, uh, and the dark web should can only be accessed by the Tor browser. And to compare in terms of domain, the deep web is similar to the surface web. You can use, you can find so many domains, uh, top level domain .com, .org, or whatever that you you mostly access with. The dark web strictly dot onion. And most of the dark websites are hidden. That means they are not indexed. Although there are some security companies who who try to uh, make products indexing uh, uh, the dark web websites or content. And to compare. Uh, in terms of the content, the deep web is mostly safe and the dark web is mostly illegal and this is per the researchers. So, I have a question to ask the audience. How many of you have accessed the dark web before via the top browser? I'm, I'm pretty sure you have, quite a number. And how many of you have accessed the dark net before? All right, see, I see a, a number of confused, confused people. All right, and this is why I'm trying to elaborate the difference between the dark web and the dark net so that you can have a better understanding how the terms are being used. So before I go to the definition, let's, let's go how it was defined in the past. I came across this paper called The Dark Net and the Future of Content Distribution. Uh, it was written by a, 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 a number of employees in Microsoft at that time. So it was defined by a collection of networks and technologies used to share digital content. Uh, it is not a separate physical network. In fact, it is a network within the internet. And some of the examples of dark nets in, at those times are peer to peer file sharing uh, applications. So if we, to, if we were to apply the definition from this paper, we get this. So these are the dark nets of the past. How many of you actually have, have seen this before? <laughs> Probably at least one, right? Uh, if, if you have not seen it before, we know what's your age, basically. <laughs> so Namster, E-Donkey, LimeWire, Kaza. Uh, and Perfect Dark is, is a Japanese version of Kaza. Uh, so, and these are basically rest in peace. Uh, no, they are no longer around. Uh, but, these are the darkness of the past if we were to purely use the definition that is being given by the Microsoft employees in that, from that paper. But times change, right? Since these are no longer around, people use the term the dark net any way they want. So I found this paper, uh, a services paper uh, from students from the FD Coburn University. Uh, the title is Determining What Characteristics Characteristic Constitute a Dark Net. And what I, find, what I find interesting in this paper is that they made it clear the distinction between the dark net and the clear net. Now, for your information, clear net is basically a, a content uh, of surface web and deep web, which is unencrypted. So anything that is unencrypted is considered clear net. You can see in the clear. Um, but what's important about how this definition is being given by them is that it refers to all collective to all encrypted communication that allow for anonymous participation and do so using a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network topology running inside the internet. So if you look at this and versus the one that is given by the Microsoft at the time, uh, you can see that quite a number of similarity, for example, decentralized running inside the internet. The only thing they don't have at the time is encryption and a lot of anonymous participation. So if we were to apply this definition for the dark net, this is what we get the known dark nets as of now, and that is, they are still around. Tor network, free net, I2P, zero net. What they have in common is that they are encrypted, which allows you to have anonymous browsing, so you don't have to worry about being monitored or, or being, uh, what? Being, being surveilled by the government's or law enforcers. Um, they also have few applications which are mostly hidden, and they are either decentralized, or they are and or distributed. So I don't have much time to actually go through every one of them. Uh, but if you want to know how it looks like for those who have yet to, to access them, all of them have their own special set of software you need to download and you need to configure. And this is where I, I think at the end of this presentation, if you want to explore, please do so. It's not as scary as it sounds. It's actually quite innocent. So for the dark web, basically you have a dot onion. 
And if you were to access the free net, this is the typical URL for free net. All right? And you can't find this easily. You need to actually know either somebody pass you the link that they create, or you try to Google search for it, um, and you will see quite a number of links. So in terms, so, and this is I2P, which is basically a dot I2P. And this is ZeroNet, which is, uh, it exists in 2016 and using a Bitcoin address, decentralized and, uh, and distributed. What I mean by distributed is that ZeroNet and FreeNet has this ability that if you were to access the, the content, you yourself will be the distributor as well. So let's say if I were to access a website from the zero net or free net, you are actually downloading the content from there. Now, while you are still using the system, somebody else are also trying to access the content as well from there. So if, let's say the main website went down, you can actually, they, they will actually go to those people that uh, already have this uh, uh, files downloaded already. And this is why it's distributed. It's not centralized. So one goes down, you cannot access it at all. No. In this case, it's decentralized it's, and it's distributed. If one goes down, any other system that has the information, you can actually browse through it as well. So, in summary, uh, there is a huge difference between the dark web versus and the dark net. The dark web is not equal to the dark net. The Tor network is one of the known dark nets out there. And using a Tor browser does not equate, of, equate you to accessing the dark web. And I'll explain to you why. So when you download a Tor browser, right, uh, the moment you double click on it, it goes to the relays, you are in. When you are in, you are still in the dark net situation. You are not accessing the dark web, nothing, right? Because it doesn't make sense for, for people to say that you use the Tor browser, you access it, you are in the dark web, it's not. Because you can access Google, you can access BBC.com, you can access CNN, Street Times, whatever, from the top of the, right? It doesn't make sense to say that because you're accessing CNN from the top browser, CNN is considered dark web. It doesn't make sense, right? You will only be in the dark web the moment you access a dot onion website. That's when you are actually accessing the hidden services. And that's when you are actually accessing the dark web. So, this is very important because a lot of people don't understand the definition of the dark net and dark web. They usually equate them together, but it's not, right? We just net versus web is very simple. So network, you are in the network, and when you access a, a website, that's when you can actually say that, okay, I'm accessing a dark website. So, so this is my definition uh, that I came up with. Uh, a dark network is actually a collection of system or devices within the internet that are decentralized and or distributed, which aims to provide a secure and anonymous browsing via encrypted communication network using its own special software and or configuration. So, let's be specific. When you see this kind of news, um, and if all these news, when they mention dark, web, dark net, they have one thing in common as well. Similarly, it, it, they are, they are referring to a dot onion website, a dark web website. So instead of calling it the dark net, they should be calling it the dark web instead. So, uh, I, so you know, a lot of people create these, uh, images of, of the iceberg trying to portray the definitions and applications, so I create one myself. Uh, so this is basically how the terms are used. Surface web is also known as the visible and index web. Um, and the deep, is also, the deep web is also known as the invisible or hidden web. Uh, and anything that is, is, is inside surface web and deep web that is unencrypted is, is called clear net. And the dark nets, uh, most of the images that you see, you will see a lot of like a lot of this portion being covered in the in the black uh, in dark, and and they mention it's dark web. Um, it's not. It's actually a collection of network within their own, uh, and these are considered dark nets. Now, and the dark web is just one of the one of the site that you are assessing from the dark net. 
So, so yeah, so, so, so this is, this could be like Tor, this could be Freenet, I2P, ZeroNet, and within Tor network, you are accessing the dark web content from the Tor network. So do not be confused between the term dark net and the dark web. And, yeah. So, um, I think it's important for us to understand because a lot of time people use the term uh, or actually abuse the term. Uh, it could be as simple as the term cyber war or cyber terrorism. And if you look at the definition by itself, a lot of scholars uh, or even a lot of security professionals define it differently. Um, so, and I think it's very important for us to understand and how they are being applied at the same time. And believe it or not, while we always think that we are actually just scratching the tip of the iceberg by using the Google search engine, a lot of the content that we have are actually within the depth of the iceberg itself. My name is Fadli Bensidi and thank you so much for having me here.